Chapter 1. August 1896, Salmon, Oregon. Harvey Butler tried not to make eye contact with the old harridan walking toward him. Mrs. Emily Johnson was always trying to stick her nose into his business, always trying to tell him how to raise his kids now that his wife was gone, God bless her soul. Mr. Butler, I want you to know that I saw your boys outside, causing a ruckus this morning. When are you going to do the right thing by your children and get them a new mother? She crossed her arms over her voluminous bosom, glaring at him over the top of her spectacles. He sighed. I'm not sure if you've looked around town lately, Mrs. Johnson, but there aren't exactly a lot of ladies who want to take on four, delightful children. He'd almost called them wild monsters, but he was afraid Mrs. Johnson would agree with his assessment of his spawn. The girls were fine, sweet even. It was the boys who people took exception with. Mrs. Johnson tilted her head to one side. If I find you a wife who is capable of taking on those children of yours, you'll marry her? I thought all your daughters were married, Mrs. Johnson. Harvey winked at her in a way that he knew she'd find terribly offensive. Some days offending the old biddy was his only form of enjoyment. As if I'd allow one of my daughters to live with those hellions you call children. She shook her head. No, I aim to send for a mail-order bride. Surely someone is desperate enough to take on that brood. Harvey shrugged. Whatever. Just don't lie to her. Make sure she knows she's getting four children, two boys and two girls, who have never behaved a day in their lives. If she comes, I'll marry her. He turned away from the woman he'd just assigned an impossible task and got back to work. He was the only person working at the sawmill he owned, and he was determined not to get behind. Asterisk. August 1896, Beckham, Massachusetts. Doris Miller sat in a corner of the living room, staring straight ahead at the wall. She was the oldest female child left at home, which meant it was her job to care for her eight younger siblings. 8. How many people had eight younger siblings? Especially when they were one of the middle children. She was glad her parents seemed to have stopped having babies every year or so. Any more, and she'd have to rip her hair out. Normally, Doris was a quiet, unassuming girl. Sure, she'd been involved in some of the pranks the demon horde had perpetuated, but not all of them. Many were done before she was old enough. And really, she hadn't ever been the one to carry out the tricks on people. No, but many had been her idea. She would sometimes get a dreamy look on her face and say, What if? And all of her siblings would stop what they were doing and listen. If Doris had an idea for a prank, it was worth carrying out. She'd been in trouble as much as her siblings, but those days were behind her. Now only the youngest seven were in school. She and her twin brother, Daryl, were finished with school, so Daryl was helping their father on the farm, and Doris was watching the children. God help me. Their mother had taken a job in town for a little while to help with the ever-mounting pile of bills that came with raising such a large family. Doris yawned. She was nineteen. She'd never had a suitor. No one wanted a girl who had once been the brains behind the demon horde. It didn't matter that she'd changed, that she now worked constantly. She was still notorious in her area, and there was no hope. She thought a young man at church would court her for a little while, but once he realized that she was part of the Miller family, well, it was all over. He'd married Mary Lou Jensen, just last week. Doris quickly brushed a tear from her eye. If the horde saw her crying, they'd know they'd gotten to her and she would never let herself admit defeat. Doris? Her mother called from the next room. Where are you? Is supper ready? Doris jumped to her feet, hurrying into the kitchen. Yes, soup is on the stove. There's a roast in the oven. Mashed potatoes on the stove. I'm going to run into town. Her mother frowned. Now? But it's late. It's Saturday. I'll stay at Lizard Breaths and come home sometime tomorrow. 
I need a change of scenery, Ma. All right. Her mother gave her a quick hug. Say hello to your sister and Bernard for me. Are you going to eat first? Dora shook her head. No, I'm not. I'm going to run up to my room and pack something to wear tomorrow. I'll see you sometime. The look her mother gave her told her she completely understood. How could she not? Everyone in the entire county knew the Miller children as the demon horde. No one wanted to be around them. Even her. Thirty minutes later, Doris was knocking on Elizabeth's door. When it opened, it was her brother-in-law, Bernard, with her nephew, Benjamin, held against his shoulder. Doris. Come in. Elizabeth is in her office. Doris nodded, hurrying around Bernard and to her sister's office. Her sister's husband was a former Pinkerton man, and though Elizabeth loved him, he made Doris very uncomfortable. She wasn't sure why. She didn't knock on the door of Elizabeth's office, instead hurrying inside and plopping down on her sofa. I can't take another day taking care of the demon horde. Do you hear me, Elizabeth? I'm going to snap. May I spend the night? Elizabeth laughed. My home is your home. What did they do now? What didn't they do? The pranks were so much more creative when I was the one thinking them up. Today, they were all fighting amongst themselves. Eggs were thrown. Apples were thrown. I believe it was a rock that broke the kitchen window, but I'm really not certain. I just know I can't do it anymore. Elizabeth turned to her desk for a moment, riffling through the letters that were always covering it. Elizabeth was a matchmaker, sending mail-order brides west to marry unattached men. She turned and handed Doris a letter without saying a word. Doris frowned, but read the letter. Her sister obviously thought she'd find it interesting. Dear Hopeful Bride I'm writing on behalf of Mr. Harvey Butler a 30-year-old widower, with four children. It's my opinion that his wife died from utter disgust when she realized what hellions her children were. But never mind that. Mr. Butler is in desperate need of a wife. In fact, this entire town is in desperate need of him finding a wife, someone who has experience with evil children preferably. The good women of this town take food to their family every afternoon so the man can keep working. Let me tell you a bit about Mr. Butler. He's tall, has dark hair, and cold, unfeeling eyes. His wife once told me he was the most handsome man in all of Oregon, but I'm sure she was nearsighted. He's a man who works hard and cares for his family, although disciplining his children seems to be beyond his abilities. He's not exactly wealthy, but he's not poor either, so you would live a comfortable life married to him. If you didn't mind sitting on pine cones and finding frogs in your pots and pans. I beg you to take mercy on all the people of Salmon, Oregon, and marry this man. Tame his children. Put us out of our misery. Mrs. Emily Johnson. Doris read through the letter once more before finally meeting her sister's eyes. This is a joke, right? She doesn't think anyone will actually marry the man with this kind of letter. Elizabeth shrugged. I'm of the opinion it's a very real letter. And I think you should answer it. When Doris began shaking her head adamantly, she continued. Think about it. You'd have your own house. You could discipline the children as you see fit, and they wouldn't be expecting someone who knew how to deal with brats, air, spirited children. Doris shook her head. I can't imagine being that desperate. Elizabeth leaned forward, her forearms against her thighs. You are that desperate. You just walked two miles in the dark so you wouldn't have to spend the night in our parents' house. You can do something about these kids. You can't about our siblings. But. It's up to you. I'm not going to force you to be a mail-order bride. I do think you'll soon regret it if you don't take the opportunity, though. This family needs you in a way no other would. You really think this is where I need to be, don't you? Elizabeth shrugged. 
When I read a letter from a groom, or some random woman writing for a groom, I sometimes know immediately who should go. I was planning to have Bernard drive me out to the house tomorrow, to talk to you. This man and his family need you, and no one else. I'll think about it. May I give you my answer in the morning? Of course. Do you want the room you used last time? Yes, I'd love that room. Maybe I'll just move in for a while. Elizabeth laughed. You know Ma needs you. I'm here if you need me, though. I'll help you get what you need put together to go if that's what you decide to do. What if I decide that's not the man I want, but I do want to be a mail-order bride? Then I'll find another groom for you. I think you'd be making a mistake though. How do you know he's the one? Doris finally asked. You're so adamant. Elizabeth shrugged. I've been in this business for eleven years. I have an instinct that's never been wrong. I hope this is the first time. I don't think you'll be saying that in the morning. Asterisk. Doris tossed and turned most of the night. When she finally slept, she dreamed of a faceless man who had four children taunting him. When she woke, she sat in bed for a few minutes, a luxury she never had at home, and thought about the letter. It pulled at her. She dressed slowly, in no hurry to go home. She'd spend as much of the day with her sister as she could, and then make the long walk home to her own private inferno. When she descended the stairs, she went straight to Elizabeth's office, knowing her sister would be working even though it was Saturday. She loved what she did so much, she had a hard time keeping office hours and frequently took the baby into her office to nurse him, rather than taking time off. Elizabeth looked up from her paperwork, smiling at Doris. You've made a decision. I can see it on your face. Dora sat down on the sofa and crossed her hands in her lap. I'm going to do it. I'm answering his letter. You feel the pull, don't you? The pull? Elizabeth frowned. I'm not sure I can describe it. Most of the women who I've matched with a man in the West have said they felt pulled in by the letter. You're feeling the pull. I am, but I don't understand why. It's not like Harvey even wrote the letter. Doris didn't understand her own reasoning for it, but she'd go. It was what she needed to do. She could feel it. It doesn't seem to matter. I'm sure you're nervous about the prospect of leaving everything and everyone you know, but it's right for you, Doris. You need to do this. Doris nodded slowly. I do. So what's the next step? As long as her sister had been a matchmaker, she'd never really talked to her about her work. You write a letter to Harvey. He'll send a letter back within about a month, telling you if he wants you to come. Doris frowned, her brows drawn together. I don't want to be here that long. Can I just go? Take him my letter myself? Elizabeth frowned. I'm not sure. I haven't had a lot of time to investigate him yet. Bernard has sent a few telegrams, but I haven't received responses. So we wait a week. Surely, you'll know if the man is bad by then. I guess, let me talk to Bernard about it while you write a letter to him. He deserves to at least know you're coming. Doris shrugged. Sure, I'll write to him. She accepted a sheet of paper and a pen from her sister and quickly began writing, not noticing when Elizabeth slipped out of her office. Dear Harvey, It sounds to me like your children are a handful. It just so happens that I'm an expert in difficult children. Not only was I once a difficult child myself, but my younger brothers and sisters are referred to as the Demon Horde. My name is Doris Miller and I would be pleased if you would accept me as your wife. I'm 19 years old, and I have a twin brother named Daryl. I am intelligent, soft-spoken, and many have said I'm pretty. Instead of waiting for a response, I'm going to send this letter, and I'm going to wait one week. After that week is up, if I have heard nothing to the contrary, I will make my way to Oregon. I will see you soon. Sincerely. Doris. 
When Elizabeth came back ten minutes later, Doris handed her the letter she'd written and turned her attention to Bernard, who was studying her with a concerned look in his eyes. I'm not going to change your mind, am I? Doris grinned. Her brother-in-law was a blonde giant of a man who had always intimidated her a bit. Suddenly, she was no longer nervous around him. No, you're not. I'll wait a week, but no longer. I have got to escape Massachusetts and the demon horde. I'll go and send a few more telegrams then. Would you like me to mail your letter? Doris nodded. That would be lovely. After he'd gone, Doris turned to Elizabeth, with a frown. I forgot about my fare. He'd have paid for my train ticket, and I can't afford to buy my own. Elizabeth shrugged. Don't worry about that. I'll see to your ticket. Would you like me to walk home with you, so I can help you tell Ma what you've decided to do? Nah. I'm not her first child who has answered the call to be a mail-order bride, or groom, for that matter. Ma will be just fine with my decision. She may not like how quickly I plan to leave because she's counting on me to watch the little demons, I guess she can have Sally step in and take her turn. Elizabeth shook her head. Sally's still an active member of the Horde. Do you think she can handle it? A slow smile crossed Doris's face. Nope. Not at all. But it will sure make Ma appreciate me, won't it? Elizabeth laughed. I'd feel bad for our mother, but, I've been in your position. Are you going to spend the day with me? Doris nodded emphatically. I have just enough money saved to make a couple of new dresses. I wouldn't want Harvey to be embarrassed when he met me now, would I? Chapter 2 A little over two weeks later, Doris found herself getting more and more nervous the closer she got to Salmon, Oregon. The place where she would find her future husband and his four out-of-control children. Before she was ready, the conductor was calling out, Salmon, Oregon. She took a deep breath, grabbed her carpet bag, which held the only belongings she'd brought with her and walked up the aisle to exit the train. There was a small platform there, and she stood for a moment, inhaling the sea air. She hadn't realized she'd be right on the coast, but she could see the expanse of the ocean going on forever. A man approached her, his hat held over his chest. Are you Miss Miller? She nodded. I'm Doris Miller. Are you Harvey Butler? He nodded. I'm not sure you were given the information you should have been given, or you'd never have agreed to come here and marry me. My children are, well, they're little beasts most of the time. At least the boys are. I see the girls following in their footsteps, too. No one in town wants to be around them, so I can't imagine why you'd take a train 2,000 miles to marry a man, sight unseen, who had those children. I'll pay your way home, if you'd like. Doris grinned. I did get the correct information. I promise you there's no one in this world more equipped to handle wild children than I am, Mr. Butler. If you'll give me a free hand with them, I'll have them in shape in no time. I won't have you hitting my children, Miss Miller. I know that many people think that if you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child, but I'm of a mind that if you beat the personality out of the child, you have nothing left. I have no problem with that. My parents didn't believe in corporal punishment either, and I believe I grew up to be a strong, confident woman. I can handle them. I promise you that. Harvey stood looking at her for a moment. She was such a small little thing, with a mop of red hair that seemed to be falling out of her pins, and green eyes that looked right into his soul. If you're sure. I'm very sure. Do you have a preacher waiting to marry us, Mr. Butler? Please, call me Harv. I feel like my father is going to answer any moment if you call me Mr. Butler. May I carry your bag? Doris didn't particularly want to give up her belongings to him, but she knew that he was just being gentlemanly. Thank you. She passed her bag off and took the arm he offered her. Where are the children now? Mrs. Johnson offered to make sure they didn't get into trouble while I was collecting you from the train station. 
As they walked, Harv told her about the town. It's pretty small. Only a couple of hundred people, but we like it here. I run the only sawmill in town, and I stay very busy. Money isn't tight, but time is. I hope you'll understand when I say it will be your job to take care of the house while I bring in the money. She nodded. That's the arrangement my parents usually had as well. Usually? She shrugged. I'm one of fourteen children. My mother was always having to work for a few months here or there to pay off a medical bill or two. My siblings liked to break their arms and legs falling out of trees or off of roofs. They do sound like an awful lot of trouble. What about you? Were you like your siblings? He was surprised to find himself truly interested in the woman beside him. He'd imagined she would care for the house and the children, and he would treat her more like a maid than a wife. After seeing her, he was sure the plan was a very bad one. Doris blushed for the first time since meeting the man. Somewhat. I was the idea person. I didn't carry out the ideas, but I got in just as much trouble as the others. So you think you can control my kids? Harve was sure there was no way she could deal with his children. She was too delicate looking. She'd learn soon enough, and then she'd head back to wherever she'd come from. At least his house would be clean for a little while in the meantime. And he wouldn't mind a bit of adult companionship for a while. Other than someone scolding him over his boys, that is. He stopped in front of a small church with a house attached. That's the parsonage. We'll probably find Pastor Savoy there. She took a deep breath. Does it seem odd to you that we're getting married and we've never even kissed? He looked at her, surprised. You want me to kiss you? He was liking the idea of marrying her more and more. I, he couldn't have taken her words more wrong. She blushed profusely, embarrassed that he thought she was asking him to kiss her there on the street. She'd only known him for a few minutes. I meant to say that it was odd we were marrying, and we've only known each other for a few minutes. He shrugged. Doesn't seem to bother me any. You're beautiful, and you think you can handle my children. I sure won't mind taking care of my husbandly duties. He winked at her, enjoying her face as her blush deepened. I'm sure that's not what I was saying at all. Doris wanted to be offended, but why? The man would be legally her husband in a matter of minutes, so he had the right to say what he wanted to her. He grinned. Let's go see the pastor, my shy little wife. Every minute in her company made him want to get to know her better. He hadn't been this attracted to a woman since his wife had died. I wouldn't exactly call myself shy, she started, surprised at the word being used to describe her. I would. He caught her hand and dragged her toward the door of the parsonage. As soon as they got there, he knocked loudly, waiting for someone to appear. When the door opened, he smiled at the prim-faced woman there. Mrs. Savoy. This is my bride, Doris. We're here to be married. Is your husband around? Mrs. Savoy peered at Doris, her face a mask of surprise. Have you had the opportunity to meet Mr. Butler's children yet? Doris grinned. I haven't, but I have been warned. I promise you, they aren't worse than I've handled in the past. And there are only four of them, not eight. It's going to feel like a holiday after dealing with eight. I'm sure I have no idea what you're talking about. Mrs. Savoy opened the door wider. I'll go and fetch my husband. She gave Doris one last confused look before she hurried away. When Pastor Savoy walked into the room, his blue eyes were filled with laughter. So I hear you're the woman who's going to take on the butler brats. Butler brats? Doris asked. I guess that's not as bad as being referred to as the demon horde. She shook her head, just a smidgen horrified by the way adults referred to children. Mrs. Savoy gasped, her hand going to her throat. Who would call innocent children the demon horde? Same sort of people who would refer to children as the butler brats, I think. 
Dora smiled at Harve, who was watching her with a grin. She winked at him, and he laughed. I think we're going to be just fine, don't you? Harve nodded. Let's get this over with, Pastor. The lady wants to marry me, and I'm not going to give her a chance to change her mind. The ceremony was short and sweet. When the pastor told Harvey he could kiss his wife, Doris blushed, but she obediently raised her lips for his kiss. His hands caught her waist, and he pulled her close, his lips barely a whisper against hers. It was just enough to make her heart stop in her chest and her hands to become clammy. He shook hands with the pastor, and they were on their way. They walked along the mostly quiet streets of Salmon, and he pointed out things she'd need to know. There's the general store. My kids aren't allowed inside, so when you go, you'll need to leave them on a bench in front of the store, but make sure you can see them from where you are. Filling her in on the idiosyncrasies of having his children with her all the time was important to him. She needed to know exactly what she'd signed up for. Why aren't they allowed inside? Doris wasn't sure she wanted to know, but she knew she needed to know what she'd be dealing with. There was an incident with 27 jars of jam, a barrel of flour, and some codfish oil. It took the owner days to clean up. I didn't think he was going to let me shop there again, but he said that it wasn't my fault my wife had died, so he lets me come in without the children. Harve watched her face as he told the story, wondering how she was going to react. How did your wife die? she asked softly, feeling bad for him. She couldn't imagine losing the person you loved most and being left with four children to care for with no help. She died birthing the girls. Twins? I didn't realize. He nodded. They're three, and the boys are six and eight. What are their names? Doris was surprised to find that she was excited about meeting her new family, Hellions or not. The oldest is Robert, but we call him Bobby. Then comes Matthew. The girls are Pauline and Priscilla. Are they identical? My twin is my brother, so we're not, but I love being a twin. I swear sometimes, I feel like we can read each other's minds. She shrugged. Well, it was like that when we were small. Not so much now that we're adults. No. They look a lot alike, and you can definitely tell they're sisters, but Pauline has blue eyes, and Pri has green. If you can't tell them apart any other way, and for a while you might not be able to, just have them look at you, and you'll see. It's hard to believe three-year-olds are already being painted by the same brush as their brothers. She shook her head, wanting to talk to the people of town. What was wrong with them? He sighed. You'll find the womenfolk have no tolerance of my children. Our children, she said softly. She was going to be their mother, and it was time they both started talking, like they were already hers. The sawmill was on the other end of town from the train station, but the walk still took no more than fifteen minutes. Everything was close there in Salmon. He nodded to the mill ahead. That's mine. Our house is behind it. Who watches the children while you work? He shook his head. I had some of the nice church ladies watching them right after Patricia died, but none of them lasted long. Oh, they loved the girls, but the boys scared them off. Now during school breaks, the boys watch the girls. During the school year, I beg for help from the good Christian women at church. I hope you don't scare easily. He reached out and put his hand on the doorknob, knowing he was about to lose his new bride when she saw the mess his children had made of the house in his absence. He pushed open the door and immediately scolded the boys. I told you not to tie Mrs. Johnson up again. Doris bit her lip as she saw Mrs. Johnson tied to one of the kitchen chairs. Would you like some help, Mrs. Johnson? She grabbed a kitchen knife from a block and cut the twine, tying the woman's hands behind her. I'm Doris. It's nice to meet you. Mrs. Johnson shook her head. It was my idea to send for a mail-order bride, but I feel bad for you. You might want to run now, before it's too late. Doris shrugged, a grin on her face. 
I'm not even a little bit afraid. Thanks for watching the children while we got married. She looked around, and it seemed that Harvey was already gone, dealing with his offspring. I hope you're stronger than you look. Mrs. Johnson left with that quick parting shot. Dora shrugged, opening her carpet bag and pulling out an apron. She put it on over her dress and immediately got to work. She was thrilled to see there was a water pump there in the kitchen, and she wouldn't have to lug buckets of water from a well. She filled a large pot full of water and set it on the stove to boil. The lunch dishes were all over the work table, and there was no way she could make supper with that kind of mess. She'd need to get everything cleaned up first. She heard a commotion behind her and turned around to face her new children. The two older boys were standing before her. Hello, Bobby, she said, nodding at the older boy. Hello, Matthew. I have a brother named Matthew. Matthew stopped squirming in his father's grip and looked at her with big green eyes. You do? Doris nodded. I do. I have five brothers. Do you believe? That's a lot. Bobby said, eyeing her skeptically. Do you really have that many? I do. And I have eight sisters, too. Fourteen kids in my family. She looked around for the girls, but they were nowhere to be seen. Where are your sisters? They're napping. That's what babies do, Matthew told her. I bet they hate to be called babies, Doris said with a grin. My youngest sister, Ida May, hates it when we call her that. She does? Bobby seemed to be confused about why Doris was being nice to him. I don't want to call you Ma. Doris shrugged. Then call me Doris. It doesn't hurt me any. If you ever feel like calling me Ma, you're welcome to. She washed off the kitchen table while she spoke to them. She ignored Harvey, who still had a hold of each of the boys' arms. Why did you tie up Mrs. Johnson? Matthew wrinkled his nose. She's mean. She called me a hellion, and said I was lucky that Pa let me live. Well, that sounds very mean. I probably would have wanted to tie her up too. Didn't you think to stuff a rag in her mouth so she couldn't talk anymore? She knew she shouldn't encourage the boys, but she also couldn't believe anyone would speak so rudely to children. Bobby's eyes widened. That would have been smart, but I didn't think of it. That's too bad, Doris said. I always hate a missed opportunity, don't you? The boys were looking at her with new expressions. There was still the wariness from before, but underneath that was admiration. Have you ever stuffed a rag in someone's mouth so they couldn't talk? Doris grinned. Oh sure. All the time. Usually my sisters and not grown-ups, but I did what I had to do. You had to do it? Matthew asked. Sometimes you have to do things that other people don't approve of, just so you can keep them from telling on you. She shrugged. It's hard growing up with so many brothers and sisters. I think I'm going to like you, Matthew said, his voice full of awe. I sure hope so, Doris responded. It's going to be hard to like you if you don't like me back. Harvey let go of the boy's arms. He could see she had everything in hand. His new bride was a spitfire. And he wasn't about to complain one bit. Chapter 3 As soon as the kitchen was cleaned to her satisfaction, Doris checked the cupboards and the icebox for food. There wasn't much there, but she could make do for one night. She turned to see Harvey with his two boys sitting there watching her cook. Do you mind if I go to the store tomorrow? I want to get some more food. You have a limited inventory here. As far as I'm concerned, you can go now. I took the afternoon off work so I can stay here with the children. Harv could see she moved around in the kitchen efficiently. His first wife had been a failure in the kitchen. As much as he loved her, it had been all he could do to stomach her cooking. Anything you want, you should just put on my account there. Just like that? They won't need you to tell them to let me do it, she asked. 
This was a small town, but she didn't know any towns were that small. He shook his head. No. Everyone in town knows that I'm getting married today. I'm sure they all had their faces pressed to their windows as we walked through town, trying to see who would be crazy enough to marry me. We're the reasons people think you're crazy now, Bobby told her seriously. No one wants kids like us. Doris grinned. I do. I think we're going to get along just fine, don't you? Bobby shrugged. Maybe. I guess I'll just have to convince you then, won't I? She grabbed a basket from a shelf that looked like it would be good for shopping. I won't be long. She opened the door to step out, but Matthew's voice stopped her. Can we have cake with our supper? We never have cake. I don't see why not. I'll get what I need for cake. Do you like white cake or chocolate cake? I like both. But chocolate is my very favorite. Matthew told her. Chocolate cake it is. She shut the door behind her, almost feeling the eyes on her as she walked down the main street of town toward the general store. They could think what they wanted. She was going to be a good mother to those boys, and in return, they'd be good sons to her. When she got to the store, she smiled at the woman behind the counter. Hello. I'm new in town. I'm Doris Miller, sorry, that's Doris Butler now. I just married Harvey. Oh, my dear. I'm so sorry. The woman hurried out from behind the counter. She seemed to be in her mid-fifties or so, and her face was very apologetic. She gripped both of Doris's hands in hers. I'm praying for you every day. Doris smiled sweetly, tamping down her anger. That's very kind of you, thank you. I believe we should all pray for one another incessantly. Hopefully the old biddy would understand that she didn't want her new sons, disparaged. Did no one have faith in those boys? I mean, have you met the boys yet? Oh, yes. Aren't they sweet? I promised Matthew I'd make a chocolate cake for supper, so I'd better hurry if I'm going to find all the ingredients for supper and still get a cake baked. Doris turned away to begin her shopping, wondering if the other woman would offer to help or continue to try to speak badly about her boys. Let me choose the cake ingredients for you. I'm assuming you don't have anything you need. I don't, and thank you so much, Mrs. Mrs. Gottweiler. My husband and I own this store. We've run it together for more than 30 years now. That's lovely. I'm so honored to meet you on my first shopping excursion. I'm sure you'll be an invaluable friend to me. Mrs. Gottweiler hurried behind the counter and paused in getting eggs down from the shelf. I'm sure I will. It's lovely to meet you, Mrs. Butler. Oh, please. Call me Doris. I won't be able to answer to Mrs. Butler for quite some time, I'm sure. The name doesn't feel like it belongs to me yet. It took me a few weeks to adjust to my new name as well when I married. My daughter said the same thing when she got married five years ago. Mrs. Gottweiler efficiently piled the ingredients Doris would need onto the counter for her to purchase. Your daughter's been married for five years? How many grandchildren do you have? Doris knew that the way to the heart of any woman was through questions about her grandchildren. Mrs. Gottweiler clapped her hands together. There are three. The third was born just a month ago. Are they here in town? For the rest of the time Doris was in the store, she was regaled with stories about three exceptionally perfect children. Why, if Mrs. Gottweiler's grandchildren were half what she said they were, they should be in the circus showing off their tremendous abilities. Before she was done, Doris had to purchase a second basket. Harvey hadn't told her to keep her purchases to a minimum, so she wouldn't worry about it. She signed for the purchases, and raised her hand in a wave, goodbye. I'm so pleased you were my first friend here in Salmon. I am too. It was delightful meeting you. Perhaps we can get together for tea someday soon. Dora smiled sweetly. 
I would absolutely adore that. Thank you for welcoming me. She had a basket over each arm as she walked with her head held high back toward the sawmill. She saw many women looking at her with open curiosity, and she would just smile and nod her head. People may look down on her family now, but she was about to change all that. Life was going to be different for the butler children. She opened the door and found the two boys where she'd left them. It was as if they were so unused to someone treating them like they were normal that they couldn't seem to stop looking at her. Are the girls still sleeping? She asked as she set the two baskets down on the work table and went about the task of putting her groceries away. I think they're playing upstairs in their room, Bobby told her, surprising her. They do that a lot when they wake up. Well, I want to meet them. Would you boys like to come with me? Bobby and Matthew exchanged a glance, but then Bobby shrugged. I can show you where their room is. The three of them went down a short hallway that led out of the kitchen and there was a flight of stairs that led up off the parlor. This way, she asked. Matthew took her hand and led her up the stairs. There were two rooms at the top of the stairs, so she could only surmise that Harvey's room would be on the first floor. Where will I sleep? She swallowed hard. Hopefully Harvey would let her wait a while before fulfilling her wifely tasks, but he hadn't seemed to be planning on it when he'd talked to her in the parsonage earlier. Bobby opened the door to a room, and Doris grinned as she saw two little girls sitting on the floor in the middle of the room, playing with a pair of dolls and jabbering away in a language only the two of them could comprehend. Hello, Pauline. Hello, Priscilla. Doris made sure she knew who was whom by the trick Harv had told her about their eyes. I'm Doris, and I'm going to be your new mama. The little girls looked at her, the confusion showing on their faces. Didn't your papa tell you I was coming? Doris sat down right in the middle of the floor and picked up one of the rag dolls. Who is this? she asked, keeping her voice soft. Lolly, Pauline answered. Then she pointed at the doll in her sister's hand. That's Dolly. Doris grinned. Lolly and Dolly. I like those names. Priscilla pointed at a third doll. That's Polly. I see. Pauline picked up another doll. This is Molly. Well, you girls certainly like rhyming names, don't you? Doris stood up from the floor. I'm about to make supper. And I'm making a chocolate cake for dessert. Would you girls like to help? They seemed confused for a moment, but finally both of them stood, each taking one of Doris's hands. Her heart ached for them. They'd never known the love of a mother, and it showed. She couldn't wait to get to know them better. As they went to leave the room, Matthew said, you have to change their diapers before you go downstairs. Doris nodded. I didn't realize they still wore diapers. I think we'll work on learning to use the outhouse this week. We have a water closet, Bobby told her. You could teach them to use the water closet. That's exactly what I'll do then. She saw the clean diapers and changed first pre and then Pauline. There. Nice and dry. And tomorrow we'll start learning to not wear diapers. They were certainly old enough to be trained, but she could understand that no one had time to work with them. Ten minutes later, she stood at the work table, with a twin standing on a kitchen chair on either side of her. She'd wrapped towels around the girls' waists to keep their dresses clean, but truthfully, their dresses were way too small and needed to be replaced soon anyway. She had a lot of sewing in her future. She could see that now. She'd make them new dresses, and then she'd make them aprons. Pretty dresses they'd be proud to wear. Harv sat at the kitchen table watching as all four of his children clamored to be around this stranger he'd married. Already they seemed to want to please her. Even his most stoic child, Bobby, the one who missed his mother the most, was with her, handing her the things she needed. When the chicken pot pie was in the oven, she gave the boys dishes to set the table and to Harv's surprise, they said it perfectly. No tricks were played. No complaining was done. 
They wanted to help her. He'd never seen anything like it. She pulled the finished cake out of the oven to cool, and she and the girls mixed up icing for the cake while the boys watched, ready to take a spoonful when she offered it to them. That's delicious, isn't it? Doris asked. She'd always loved to work in the kitchen. Her mother had been letting her cook for years. It was where she felt the most accomplished. Bobby nodded, his eyes lit up. I haven't had cake in a long, long time. Not since right after your mother died, Harve said, his voice a bit harsher than he meant for it to come out. When his wife had first died, the neighbors had rallied around them. They come in every day to help with the girls, and they'd brought meals. At first, the meals had been nice wonderful culinary feasts. Gradually, as it became clear he wasn't looking for another wife, they'd dwindled to a leftover casserole. The meals hadn't stopped coming, but the love that had initially been put into the meals had disappeared. They'd become a burden on the whole town. Bobby nodded, his face full of sadness. A very long time. So the twins have never had chocolate cake? Doris asked, her face shocked. I never really thought about that, but no, I don't think they have. Then I'll have to make lots of cakes to make up for the way they've been neglected over the years. Cake makes everyone happy. Matthew didn't say anything, but he wrapped his arms around Doris's waist from behind and just held on to her. Thank you for coming here to be our mama. Doris felt tears fill her eyes, but she didn't turn around. She didn't want them all to see how much the boy had touched her. I am so glad to be here to be your mama. We're going to be happy together. When they sat down to eat their supper, Harp prayed the most heartfelt prayer he'd said in years. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing this wonderful woman to Oregon to be in our lives. Please help us to make her as happy as she's made us in the short time she's been here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Doris felt tears touching her eyes again as she served supper to each of the children. No cake unless you eat everything on your plates. There was no danger of any of them not eating. The children dove into the food as if it had been months since they'd had a good meal. I'm going to need all of you to tell me what your favorite foods are. I got most things that I thought I'd need at the store, but all you have to do is tell me, and I'll make it if I know how, Doris told them. Bobby looked at her, a bite of food in his mouth that he chewed slowly. You're not like our real mama. She made yucky food. Doris frowned. Do you want me to make yucky food? Bobby shook his head. No, you keep making good food. It will remind me that you're not her. Harvey ate his food in silence. Bobby was right. Doris was a much better cook than Patricia. She was probably better at everything than his first wife had been. Except at loving. Patricia had had the capacity to love everyone. No, he'd need to keep his heart guarded against this new wife of his. When Doris served the cake, giving them each a big slice, Pre took a bite and hummed happily. Yummy! I'm glad you like it, Doris said with a laugh. I'll have to bake some cookies tomorrow, or maybe a pie. Which would you boys prefer? Matthew's eyes were wide. Cookies tomorrow and pie on Sunday. You should always have pie on Sunday in case the pastor comes over. Does the pastor come over on Sunday? Doris asked, a little confused. Harv shrugged. No one has come over except to bring us food in a long while. Hopefully having you here will change that. Doris hoped he didn't think she could change everything. She was just a rather small woman. She would do her best, but changing the world wasn't going to happen. Chapter 4 After supper, Doris did the dishes while the twins sat at the table and jabbered away at her. She had been raised that the boys did the outside chores and the girls worked in the house. She wasn't sure if she felt that was how she and Harve should raise their children, but she'd talk to him about it later. After the kids were in bed. As soon as the dishes were done, she took the twins into the parlor to join their menfolk. 
She had a twin on each knee, telling them a story about one of her sisters. It was a joy to be able to hold these children and know that she would have an influence on them. Why had she even thought it might be a bad idea to answer that letter? When it was time to put the children to bed, Doris and Harve climbed the stairs together, each of them carrying a sleepy twin. She changed them both, telling Harvey over her shoulder that she would work on training them to use the water closet the very next day. They weren't going to be in diapers for much longer if she had anything to say about it. After they tucked the boys in, she preceded him down the stairs. When they got to the parlor, they looked at one another. Doris blushed, and Harvey rubbed the back of his neck, slightly embarrassed as well. I guess I should have shown you around the house as soon as you got here. I'm sorry I didn't think of that. Mrs. Johnson was tied to a kitchen chair. Anything you'd planned to do would have flown your mind when you saw her there. And she was perfectly capable of looking around the house and finding what she'd needed to find. It had been easy enough for her. He laughed. That's true. I can't believe you didn't scold the boys for that. She shrugged. I read the letter that woman sent about your children. I don't think anyone needs to feel sorry for her. I can just imagine what she said to make the children behave that way. She shook her head. Is school in? They start Monday. I'm glad you got here when you did. The boys will be able to go to school, and I won't have to worry about the girls. Who watched them last school year? Some of the ladies from the church took turns coming over. It was someone different every week, and that person would cook supper. I still had to see to breakfast and lunch. She frowned. It sounds like you've had it really rough the past few years. I hope I can take some of the weight off your shoulders by being here. If you'll just cook three meals a day, that will take a lot of the weight off me. And then taking care of the girls. Training them to use the water closet. There are so many ways you'll help, just by being here. I will do anything I can. I already love the children. They're all darling. That's only because the boys were on their best behavior. When they start acting like themselves, you'll wonder what you thought was good about them. Harvey shrugged. Why don't I show you where you'll sleep? Dora swallowed hard. I assume we'll be sharing a bed? He nodded. That's generally what married people do. I, I wonder if you can give me a little time to get used to you, before we do more than simply sleep in a bed together. He frowned. Are you refusing? Not at all. I'm asking you kindly for a little time to get to know you before we become intimate. Would that be a problem for you? Harvey was surprised by how much of a problem it would be. They'd only been married a few hours, but there was something special about the woman in front of him. He didn't want to wait. I reckon not. She smiled. Thank you. How long are you thinking you're going to need? No more than a month or two. He grimaced. You've got two weeks. Better make the most of them. He turned away from her and started from the room. Our bedroom is this way. She followed him, grinning to herself. He'd agreed to give her time, which she'd needed, but he'd certainly made it clear exactly how much time he was willing to give her. When they got to the bedroom she'd share with him, she looked around the room. There was a nice dresser, a wardrobe for her dresses, and a very pretty headboard on the bed. She could see the quilt needed to be washed, but she'd see to that as soon as she could. There was so much work to be done. First thing in the morning, she'd look over everything and make a list, then she'd prioritize the list. It felt wonderful to know that anything she did would make her family happy. This is a nice room, she said softly. He just looked at her for a moment. I'll give you ten minutes to get ready for bed before I come in. I start work at seven, so breakfast by six is good for me. I don't think that will be a problem. On the farm where I grew up, we had breakfast by 5.30 every morning. She hid a yawn behind her hand. I'll be in bed in ten minutes. 
I promise. He stood there uncertainly for a moment, but then he left, closing the door tightly behind him. He leaned back against the door and looked down at his hand. He realized it was shaking. He wasn't sure if it was because she was so pretty and he would be sleeping beside her, or if he felt guilty for having carnal feelings for any woman other than his Patricia. Would he have wanted Patricia to remarry if he had died? Thinking about it, he realized he would. He'd have wanted her to have the security of having a man to support her while she stayed home with the children. It was something they'd always felt was important. So maybe he shouldn't have feelings of guilt for remarrying. As soon as he'd left the room, she sprang into action, quickly removing her dress and pulling her nightgown over her head. Someone had kindly delivered her things to the room she'd use, and she hadn't even noticed. She didn't want to climb beneath the sheets, which obviously hadn't been washed in a while, but she didn't have a choice tonight. She was too tired for it to matter. Tomorrow, she'd see to washing all the bedding first thing. But she still had to make sure the boys had school clothes, and the girls needed clothes, and everyone needed to eat, and the whole house needed a good cleaning from bottom to top. She took a deep breath. None of that could be accomplished tonight. Tonight, she needed to sleep. After a week on a train, she wasn't certain she'd ever sleep well again, but she had to. She needed to have her wits about her and every bit of her strength. Her family needed her. She put her head on the pillow and smiled to herself. Her family. They were hers, whether they knew it yet or not. She closed her eyes, and she was asleep even before her new husband joined her. Asterisk. When Doris woke the following morning, she was snuggled against a very solid form. She'd always shared a bed with one of her sisters, so it wasn't odd to wake up beside someone, but it was odd for the body to be so hard. Her eyes flew open. It was Harvey. Her new husband. She tried to slowly slide out of bed on the opposite side, sure that it was time for her to fix breakfast, but her hair was trapped under his shoulder. She tried to free it, but saw his eyes open as he gazed right at her. Good morning, Harv, she said softly. Would you mind freeing my hair so I can fix breakfast? What about a morning kiss first? He asked, his eyes still heavy with sleep. You've only kissed me once, and that was with the preacher standing right there watching us. I'm not even sure we should count that as a kiss. I believe you kissed me. He grinned. So I did. Now you kiss me, and then I'll let you have your hair. She bit her lip nervously. She'd only been kissed once in her life, and she had no idea how to go about initiating something like that. She gently leaned into him, her lips brushing against his. She felt his lips flutter under hers, and she was glad, because now he'd take over the kiss, and the pressure she felt to make the kiss good would be gone. Harv rolled to his side and up onto one elbow, never letting their lips part. He caught her waist and pulled her closer to him. Her body molded against his. Good morning, wife. She sighed, resting her head against the pillow. Good morning. Doris realized then she was free, and she rolled out of bed, grabbing her dress and hurrying from the room to the water closet. It would be easier to change in there. Ten minutes later, she was in the kitchen, carefully slicing off pieces of bacon to fry. She'd already mixed up a bowl of pancake batter. She didn't know what the butlers usually ate for breakfast, but this morning they'd have bacon and pancakes. She found some coffee and started a pot on the stove, grateful that he was a coffee drinker. At the moment, she was still tired enough that she wasn't sure she'd make it through the day without a cup or two. When Harvey meandered into the kitchen twenty minutes later, he had a plate of pancakes and bacon sitting at his spot at the table, along with a hot cup of coffee. I wasn't sure how you took your coffee, she said, not meeting his eyes. Do you want milk or sugar? He shook his head. No, it's perfect just the way it is. He took a sip, noting that she looked embarrassed. Thanks for fixing breakfast for me. You'll probably want to put the rest into the oven. 
The kids will sleep until seven or eight. She nodded. I'll eat with you, and then I can get started on some of the chores I want to get done today. He raised an eyebrow at her as he took a bite of his pancakes. Chores? He asked after slowly chewing. There's so much to do. Laundry, baking, sewing, cleaning, I don't even know where to start. Do the boys have clothes that fit for school? He shrugged. They did at the beginning of the last school year. I'll check. Would it be all right if I bought some fabric for clothes for them and for the girls? From what they wore yesterday, I think they've all outgrown everything. He nodded. Just have Mrs. Gottweiler put it on my account. Don't go too crazy now. I'm not a rich man. He grinned at her, expecting her to immediately know he was joking with her. Do you want to give me a budget to stay under? I'm very familiar with working within a budget. He grinned. I'm sure you won't pauper me. Just don't buy yourself diamonds and pearls or anything crazy like that. She shook her head. I promise I will only purchase things to make clothes for the children. And food. And cleaning supplies. She sighed. I probably will spend a lot more this week than I ever will again. His hand covered hers. Don't worry about money. If you spend more than I would like, I'll just take a month or two to pay it off. It's not a problem. She nodded, pulling a piece of paper and a pencil toward her. I'm going to prioritize everything that needs to be done. I think clothes for the children need to come first. Do you agree? He shrugged. I could use some more clothes before winter as well, but I can wait a month or two. What time does the store open? She asked. I believe it opens at eight. All right. That'll give me time to get the laundry on the line before I go over there and pick out fabric for the children's clothes. Do you think the girls would like to pick out the pattern for their own dresses? Her whole face lit up at the idea of involving the girls. Harvey shook his head. I'm sure they'd love it, but I don't think they'll let them over the threshold of the store. So as much as they'd enjoy it, it's not possible at this time. How long are they banned from the store for? I've not been given an end date. I'm assuming until the end of time, plus another week or so. He shook his head. That store was a mess when the kids were done with it. Doris grimaced. That's going to make things harder. But I can have the girls sit on the bench in front of the store, and I can hold up fabric for them to see. Maybe they can choose that way. You're not going to dress them alike, are you? Harvey had never liked it when people forced twins to always dress alike. She shook her head. No. I'll have them in the same style of dress, but different colors. That way it'll be easier to tell them apart as well. Is it hard for you? He asked, surprised. She'd been referring to them as the correct names with no problem the previous evening. I have to think about it. If I have them in different colors, and I always know which color they're in, I'll have an easier time of it. Would that bother you? Not at all. I'm glad you care enough to try to tell them apart. A lot of the women who have come to help me never bothered. They just called them both twin, which was an insult to them both. They're more than twins. They have their own personalities. I know that. Remember, I'm a twin too. She stood up and started clearing the dishes they'd used from the table. Do you want more? He shook his head. No, thank you. It was delicious, but I have work to do. Me too. Doris was wary as he walked up behind her. He cupped her face in his hands and kissed her soundly. I'll be at the sawmill if you need me, but I have a feeling you'll have everything under control. That's why you married me, isn't it? He nodded. Yes, I suppose it is. Dora smiled until he'd left the room, and then she sighed loudly. She knew that was why she was there, so why did it hurt to hear him admit it? 
Of course he needed help with his children and needed her to take care of their home. He hadn't married her for love because he didn't know her. She knew all that. So why did it hurt so much? She finished the dishes and walked into their bedroom to strip the bed. Laundry, then shopping. The next few weeks were going to be hard. Chapter 5 At the end of the day, Doris was exhausted, but it was a good tired because she'd accomplished so much. The bedding had all been washed and was back on the beds. The floors had all been scrubbed. She'd even let out the hems on all of Bobby's pants and found old pants of Bobby's that would fit Matthew until she had time to make more for him. The boys would be set for school and she would be able to start on the girls' dresses, which were needed even more, the next day. She had already cut the fabric and just needed to start sewing, hopefully in time for church the next day. She and the girls had made cookies for dessert, and they had declared they liked them even better than cake. So far there had been no problems with behavior from the boys, but she wasn't complacent about it. She knew school was about to start, and there would be problems at school. The boys were too rambunctious for it to be otherwise. She was certain that if she gave them time and love, they would calm down and be model children. At least she hoped so. Harvey joined her in the parlor after the children went to bed. I usually sleep in on Sundays. Service doesn't start until nine, so I get up about seven. All right. I'll have breakfast ready at seven then. I'll probably get up earlier because I want to see if I can finish the dresses for the girls before church. That's a lot to do in just a little time. Do you think you can handle it? She shrugged. I'll do my best. That's all I can really promise. Well, don't work too hard. I want you to be here to help me raise these kids for years to come. No getting sick on me. He'd already lost one wife. What would he do if he lost another? Dora smiled. I'm healthy as a horse. I promise. No dying for me. He took her hand in his. I hope not. The children are starting to really like you. I like them, too. We had a good day today. Did you let the girls pick out their own fabric for dresses? She nodded. I did. It was fine showing them the fabric through the window, and I talked to Mrs. Gottweiler about them coming back to the store. She said that I could start bringing them in one at a time, but only the girls. The boys are banned for a while yet. It had been a difficult conversation, because the older woman really didn't trust the children, but Doris was glad they'd had it. I can understand that. Did the girls like picking out their dresses? They were so excited. Pre wanted a pink dress with flowers on it, and Pauline liked a green striped dress. As long as they're happy, I don't really care. If I don't have the dresses ready for church tomorrow, I'll have them ready by next week. I really would like to make them each two or three dresses this week. And then I'll get to work on the boys' clothes for school, and do something for winter. The work never ends, does it? My mother used to say that, but she had us girls to help. I always thought she was exaggerating. And was she? No. And there were fourteen of us. At least you only have four. She was sewing as quickly as her fingers would move as they talked, stabbing the needle into the fabric over and over to finish one of the dresses. The townspeople had been saying bad things about the butlers for years, but now that she was here, she wanted only good things said. Are you going to sew for a while yet? he asked, looking at the clock. She shrugged. I'd like to finish this dress for pre tonight, and then I can do Pauline's in the morning, before church. All right. I'll read the paper while you sew then. You don't have to stay up with me. I can stay up alone. I would like to stay up with you. Harvey caught her chin with one finger, lifting her face to his. I like getting to know my new wife. She smiled. That would be very nice then. She didn't know how they'd get to know each other more with him reading the newspaper, but maybe he could tell her the stories he read about. 
She'd seen her mother frantically sewing while her father kept her up on current events many times. Harvey went to get the newspaper, and she continued sewing. He didn't just tell her about the news stories. When he found one he thought would interest her, he read the paper aloud. You'd be shocked at what Mr. Cleveland just did. Listen to this. He proceeded to read her a story about their president. While Doris wasn't terribly interested in current events, she did enjoy listening to Harvey Reed. His deep voice filled the room, and she didn't grow bored as she worked on the dress. An hour later, she held up the small dress. There. That one's done. What do you think? He looked at it and nodded approvingly. Truthfully, he wasn't sure what he was looking at. It looked like a little dress to him. As long as it covered one of his daughters, he didn't care how it looked. It's very nice. Do you think Pri will like it? She chose the fabric, didn't she? Why was she asking him? He knew nothing about how a little girl's mind worked. She did. She said she wanted a dress with a pretty bow that tied in the back, so that's what I made. I hope it makes her happy. All of her dresses were way too tight. He frowned. I knew they were tight, but no one was willing to make dresses for them. I offered to pay a couple of the ladies in town, but they didn't want to spend enough time with my kids to make them clothes, especially not when the boys were home during the summer. That's really sad. He shrugged. We've made do. I'm sure one of them would have come along and made something for them while they told me I was neglecting them by not getting them a new mother. He sighed. I felt like I needed time to mourn my wife. I can understand that. I can't imagine losing someone I love. He looked away, unable to handle the look in her eyes. She was a good, loving woman. He wasn't sure he was ready for someone like her to be in his life again yet. I'm going to get ready for bed. Are you finished here? She nodded, folding the dress and setting it beside her on the sofa. Yes, I'm ready. I'll give you ten minutes again. He wanted time to be with her in bed tonight. He knew she wasn't ready for more than light kisses, but he at least wanted those. Hopefully she wouldn't fall asleep before he got into their room with her. She hurried into the bedroom and changed into her nightgown. She happily slid between the clean sheets. It felt so much better tonight, knowing that it was clean. She rolled to her side, facing the middle of the bed. Last night she'd been asleep before he came in, but tonight, she wasn't quite that tired. She'd barely slept on the train, and she'd gotten a good night's sleep the night before. She was still awake when he came in a moment later and turned down the lamp, undressing in the dark. She heard every movement as he undressed, and it felt strange to her, knowing he'd be joining her in their bed. When Harvey slid between the sheets beside her, he pulled her close to him. Why didn't you marry? Surely someone with your looks and your homemaking skills was in high demand. If my last name had been anything else, maybe I would have been in demand. But I was a miller, and everyone knew that meant that I was once a member of the demon horde. Some of the older women at church named us that when I was just seven or so. And then everyone in town called us that. A couple of years ago a new man, James, moved to town. He went to our church, and I caught him watching me a few times. We talked after church. And then one day, he was seeing someone else. I heard it was because I was part of the demon horde. He married her, and I kept on watching my younger brothers and sisters. He didn't even bother to get to know you? He was shocked. If there'd been a pretty girl like her around before he married, he'd have gotten to know her right away. You know how people in this town think of your boys? That's how they thought of all of my brothers and sisters and me. It was like as soon as they heard my name, they thought I was evil. None of us were evil. Mischievous, I'll admit to. Evil? Never. We wouldn't have known how to be evil. He thought about that for a moment, hoping that people would forget his boys' reputations before they grew up. 
My boys have only been on their best behavior around you. I hope they keep it up, but I know it won't last forever. She shrugged. I really don't expect it to. But I do expect that they will grow out of their antics. If they have someone who showers them with attention, they won't feel the need to pull pranks so people know they exist. I always knew they existed, he protested. Was she criticizing his parenting? Did she have any idea how hard it was to raise four children while working as many hours as he did? I know you did. But they may not have felt it. I bet when you were home, you spent more time with the twins. They're younger, and they needed more of your attention. Was it after your wife's death that they started acting up? She knew that any time her mother had worked, she and her siblings had caused more problems. In their case it wasn't so much because of lack of attention and more opportunity. The boys would have both attention and less opportunity with her there. He nodded. I guess it was. Maybe you're right. They needed more time than I could give them. That's where I come in. I will have the time to give them all of the attention they need. I can help them with schoolwork, make them clothes, cook their favorite foods, I'm going to bet that their behavior is automatically better as a result. I don't expect them to be perfect, because they're children. But better. I hope you're right. He snuggled her closer to him, her head against his shoulder. Are you ready to meet everyone at church tomorrow? You haven't met many of the ladies yet, have you? He was almost afraid for her to meet the women of the church. They were judgmental, to say the least. She shook her head. Just Mrs. Johnson, who was tied up in my kitchen when I arrived, Mrs. Savoy, who thought I was making a huge mistake, and Mrs. Gottweiler, who likes me because I asked about her grandchildren. She knew it wasn't a good start, but she'd do her best to get to know everyone as quickly as she could, though she wasn't sure how much she cared to get to know them. They hadn't been as kind to her new family as she would have liked. There are quilting circles that I'm sure you could join. There are so many things you could do to get to know the ladies of this town. She shrugged. Right now, I think my time is better spent with the children. They need my time and attention. And there are so many things to do around the house. Maybe in a few months when I feel like I'm caught up with my housework. Thank you for making my family your priority. You mean our family? She leaned forward just a bit and brushed her lips against his. They were her children now, whether he liked it or not. Yes, I mean our family. You are exactly what we need. He wasn't sure if he would ever be able to let his guard down enough to fall in love with her after losing Patricia, but hopefully she would be content anyway. She certainly seemed to like the children. Is it important to you that I become friends with the ladies in town? At that moment, she didn't have a lot of fondness for the people who hadn't treated him and the children well. She understood that it was a hardship to constantly be helping out like the women had, but she'd done it for others back in Beckham. It was the Christian way to help one another out when it was needed. Not really, but I think it will be important to you. You don't want to be without female friends, do you? She shrugged. I'd rather be without friends than have only friends who would turn their back on a family in need. That doesn't sound like the Christian thing to do to me. He grinned. You don't have to defend me. You don't know why they quit coming to help. She laughed. I have a really good idea. I'm sure Mrs. Johnson isn't the only lady in town who's been tied up in your kitchen. I'm sure the children were right beasts to some of the ladies. But the thing is, they're children. They needed love and care, and it wasn't given to them as it should have been. He frowned. I wish I'd been able to spend more time with them. And maybe I could have. I just, I've had a hard time dealing with Patricia's death. And every time I looked at any of my kids, they were a reminder of her. Doris reached out and stroked his cheek. I'm so sorry you lost her. Not for me, of course, because I'm happy to be here. But it would have been so much better for you and your children if she'd lived. 
yes, it would have. But I'm grateful for you. Already you've made the house cleaner than it's been in years. You're jumping into working here, when you should still be too fatigued from your travel to even think about all that needs to be done. Pri has a pretty new dress, and soon Pauline will have one too. You're the mother they need if they can't have their own. I'll do my best to treat them as she would have. Do me one favor though, would you? Doris frowned. Of course. Whatever you need. Don't start cooking like their mother did. No one would be happy with that. She laughed. Her cooking couldn't have been that bad. Harvey smiled. It was worse. I ate her cooking because I never wanted to hurt her feelings, but sometimes even the dog wouldn't eat it. Dog? You have a dog? He shook his head. We used to back then. He was killed not long after she died. They were very close. We always had dogs growing up. It was part of living on a farm. It was like having a cow. You had a cow, a cat, and a dog. Do you want to get another dog? Maybe we can find a puppy in town. I'm not sure, I love animals, but I think I need to get the girls trained first. How did that go, by the way? Really well. I helped train my sister, Ida May, so I'd done it before. Both girls like the idea of using the water closet. I think they'll be trained within the week. Really? She nodded. They're old enough, and they're ready. It won't take long. Have I told you yet how thankful I am that you were the one to answer that awful letter Mrs. Johnson sent? He couldn't imagine another woman who was as willing to throw herself into their lives. Yes, but would you tell me again? I would, but I don't want it to make you think you're better than everyone around you. She laughed. Good night, Harve. Good night, Doris.